Can you hear me okay, uh, Latia? I can. Can you hear me? Uh, you're really low volume wise. How's that? Better. Cool. Is that better or is that good? No, it's good. Whoa. As I hit my mic. Cool. I'm going to pull up all my documents, get everything ready. All right, more people. So I'm gonna give it just a couple more minutes.
All right, we'll start this up in one more minute. All right, Letty, you ready to go? I am ready to go. You ready to go? Yeah, let's do this. All right. So uh, um, I'll start out. Hey, everybody. So uh, what the purpose of this class is today is to talk about Fabris's second book. And um, if you have a copy of the manual, you can see that the uh, Fabris's, um manual, or whatever copy you have, is uh, two books with uh, three parts each. The uh, We've been talking about the first book so far, which includes um, basically working from from, med, from normal measure and executing based on Tempe. And uh, the second book introduces a new theory of Fabris's. Well, maybe not necessarily new, new, but it's he introduces it in this book, uh, which is he calls advancing, um, advancing with resolution. And uh, we can, we'll describe this as we, as we talk about this. And uh, anyway, Letia is going to do the first part where she's gonna talk about single rapier and she'll lead off with the general concepts. And then I will add to that and kind of like how we've been doing normally. And then I will introduce the rapier and dagger section. Uh, oh yeah. And uh, Letia will also do um, two, one or two plays from the single, the single portion. And then I will do, introduce the rapier and dagger section and talk about two of the plays from that. So without further ado, uh, I'm going to hand this over to Ledia and she can uh, introduce the, the larger topic. So um, as we were saying, this is book two, Proceeding with Resolution. And um, in the first part, he gives kind of an introduction of what that is and he goes off by being like cool you know your basic principles but you know what everybody knows these at this point because italian rapier is the thing we're doing and they all are a lot of the same basic you know line tempi measure fault patterns um but that's great you're 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 doing great now but we're gonna introduce something new and he even goes as far as saying perhaps wishing to palliate their own lack of skill, uh, talking about these things being commonplace to stand in guard. He kind of does that insult thing that all the masters are doing and jabbing at his contemporaries for only doing the stand and wait in guard. Um, so basically Fabris is saying, you got that down, yeah, basic. This is what the, the meat of everything is. Um, so, Oh, the screen did weird things when it went full screen. Let me get my notes back. Um, notes, where'd you go? Sorry about this, guys. Um, escape out of full screen. There we go. Um, so if both people are doing the same thing, they're both trying to force a tempo and wait for a tempo, whoever goes first is automatically going to lose that tempo. So he wants to introduce something that allows you to get beyond the same game that everyone else is playing. Um, and he even goes so far as kind of saying that once you learn this, you know, unless you also learn somebody from Fabris, you're going to win. Um, so we're going to go to the next slide because we've kind of introduced the second book part. There we go. Um, so the overall reason he says to do this is that by doing the basics, you're trying to force a tempo. And if both people are trying to force a tempo, no one's going to have an advantage because you're both working to find the same thing. You're both working, fighting over the same 
think, hopefully a tempo. Um, so the idea is if you have the advantage at all, you should just, whoop, slides are going away. If you have the advantage at all, you should proceed forward because you don't necessarily, you have an advantage, you don't necessarily need to gain the tempo as well. Um, if you wait for the tempo, you could uh, hurt your own game because you might lose that advantage that you already had in trying to gain that tempo. Um, so you don't want to lose what you've acquired. And uh, you could, though making a tempo through feints or openings gives your opponent a tiny tempo as well, because even if it's a small tempo, you're trying to make a tempo. So if you just take it with a movement, um, once you have any advantage at all, um, that could give you the advantage to win the fight. And because not everyone is using the idea that you go before gaining a tempo from your opponent, you go the moment you have advantage, uh, you would win in his, in his theory of what makes a fight win. If you are both of equal skill and they're not playing this game, because you have that advantage of playing this game, you would win. If you're playing the equal game, it's anybody's game. Or even if they're a more skilled opponent, you know, they're more likely to win. So if you're doing this and you're equal, you're going to win because you are be you're not fighting for the same advantage. You're not fighting for the tempo. Um, and he basically, you know, is being sassy at that point where he's like, my system's better. Good job, guys. Um, so we're going to move on to the advantages, not just the overall reasons, but the advantages of specifically this, why you can gain that tempo. So, Leti, I'm going to check the uh, waiting room real quick to see if uh, yeah. anybody's waiting to let any late people in. While nope. he's checking the waiting room, were there any questions on that part? Cool. All right. So we're going back to this. Uh, one thing, uh, Leti, if I can add, um, just to introduce this concept, uh, I really like a quote that Fabris uses in this introduction section that really kind of sets the tone for this whole thing. And that is, uh, he says, what we are looking for here is a way to attack the opponent immediately after unsheathing the sword without stopping and without regard to the opponent's guards, postures, tempi, parries, attacks, advance, or retreats. The advantage comes from your ability to put the opponent into obedience and force him to do as you wish, whether he tries to defend or counterattack. So that is just, if I could summarize like the whole concept at play here, that's what it is. So going back over to Lydia, so advantages. Advantages, and that's a great quote. Um, so the advantages, and he actually uses this quote early in, which did not make it into my slide. Um, he says, a person who moves from a stationary position will always be slower by virtue of his weight than one who is already in motion. And that's what kind of the base of these advantages are. Basically, he's saying Newton's first law, an object in motion likes to stay in, emotion, stay in motion and an object in rest likes to stay in rest. So he's basically taking that concept and implying that, applying that to motion within the fencing game. Um, so moving a foot um, is a two tempi action. So you're gonna be slower if you have to lift your foot and put it down than if your feet are already in motion because you already have one foot up ready to be put down. So that's a, a smaller one tempi action than lifting and putting down. So that is one advantage of being already in motion. Um, if you are in motion, you are already half there, that half foot lifted that I just said, you know, you are already either foot up are about to be placed, but you're not gonna be up and down uh, in that double tempo. Uh, if you are in a stationary guard, you, more, you are more easily read for your weaknesses. And I misspelled read on purpose, so I wouldn't say read. Um, so it's, you are more easily read for your um, weaknesses. If you've got a hole in your guard and you're just standing there, they can analyze you, boop, 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 there as opposed to if you're moving where they have to pay attention to your motion and analyze you and see if that weakness stays while you're in motion. And that's a lot for anyone to process when they've got a sword coming in their face. If you're standing back, you're like, ah, it's a little weak over there. I can get over there. So that's a good reason to stay in motion. It's, it's easier to hide your weaknesses. 
and hide your game plan. Even if it's not a weakness, they can, you know, be like, she's going to do that over there to here. It's harder to, to pre-plan that. Um, it's easier to take a tempo if you're emotion in mo already in motion because you don't have to break that stillness and you're going to be less likely to be late if you are reacting to your opponent's motion because you are already in motion um, and you already have momentum going forward. So you don't have to break stillness into a motion. Um, my phone is going off for no reason. Good shush phone. Um, stationary stances are easier to break with feints and invitations because if you have a very uh, planned stance, you have, to, you have to think about moving and then moving back or moving into a new stance. You have to break that uh, stillness that you've already got. If you're in motion, you are already planning to move those uh, stances about. So it's easier if you create a feint or create an invitation for somebody to overcommit to that. If you're in motion already, you're already making small motions and small adjustments. You've already got movement going on within your uh, game in his in, in this proceeding with resolution theory. Um, and it uh, the proceeding with resolution creates the need for the opponent to break measure to regain guards or tempos because things are in constant motion. So they they have to either come forward or come back. It's it's a different it measure becomes more involved with their actions and they can't control it as well if you're controlling it moving forward. Um, and one thing to keep in mind is you have to keep the union of sword, foot and body together. Um, he mentions this several times that if you are just kind of walking in wildly, your swords are wild or whatnot, you're not actually keeping yourself safe. Having all these things joined together and working within the system is an important part of making sure you keep yourself defended and safe as you move in um, and are able to disrupt your opponent. So I'm gonna break real quick to see if there's any questions on that one. I can also add something. Uh, yeah. So one one thing that uh, that he that he mentions that's really good strategically is he says that um, that because you're advancing quickly, or rather, you're advancing with resolution. Um, it limits the exchange to really only one or two tempi. So, or one or two intentions as you probably hear more often in the SCA. So if you have an opponent who likes to kind of go deep into that exchange territory, this is a good approach to kind of take that away from them because by the time you get into the second tempo, either the hits happened or they're backpedaling or you're, you're now a jumble. So basically it forces the, the exchange into the first one or two, ten, and you know, the, first, first, the first intention and the second intention-ish. Uh, so that's really, it keeps the fight to that very limited uh, frame. Um, with that, we're moving on to feet, unless we have any questions popping up. Cool. Um, so he talks about moving feet. Um, he he uh, suggests using small, quick strides, but ordinary walking, fairly ordinary walking steps. He cautions several times about not forcing the step. Um, so the small, quick, uh, ordinary walking steps, like uh, not not these big, wide, giant um, steps that you might think of to get into measure quickly. Um, because smooth is fast. Um, the only time you should widen your step is when you are about to hit your opponent. Um, I think the quote is actually a uh, widen step when the point of the sword reached the opponent. Uh, he doesn't necessarily specify um, if that's when the point is touching the opponent or touching his guard, but I, from reading the rest, I'm assuming it is touching the opponent itself. So when you're about to make that final hit. Um, and I'm just uh, iterating that that's vague enough that I could not from that sentence be like, definitely this. Let's um, my interpretation of that is that he means that you're, you're these, those like narrow steps are as you're getting into measure and those wider steps 
uh, should be in conjunction with a blade action, basically when you're moving laterally um, to execute an offensive action. So basically the little steps to, to, get, to get in there. And then if you need to, a wider step would be to gain an advantage of the blade um, in conjunction with like moving to secondo or quarta or that sort of thing. So those wider steps are a strategic choice when executing that offensive action. Um, he also talks a lot about you would bend forward as you're getting close to your opponent, which would allow you to take those wider steps because you're narrowing your um, your stance, which also lowers your center, which would let the a natural wide step. So I think what you were saying makes sense with that as well. Um, so um, he does say never force the step because you will be disrupted you will disrupt your own momentum. So you don't wanna take steps so big that they're jerky. Um, and you also don't wanna be so slow that you're gonna create yourself to be disjointed. And I kind of think about this as if you were to take a flip book and you're gonna flip through. And if you flip through at the right speed, everything looks nice and smooth. But if you flip through too slow, this pages kind of start flopping and sticking together and it looks really jerky. Um, so you don't want to get to the point where you're doing one step, one step, one step, like it's a flip book and you don't want to flip so fast that you're, you're missing actions and, and, you know, you're skipping sections. So you kind of want to be a nice, smooth, gentle walking action. Um, you so when, when Tom Leone interprets the term force for never force the step, um, he does include a reference that says that he's interpreting that, that from the Italian word violente. So uh, that that is oh, a no cognate. <laughs> so that is a cognate with English. So force is kind of is is an affectation of Tom Leone's translation. I like to use the term rush for that because I think rush rushing the step is uh, also fits kind of in turn in in the in the vein of um, of violente. So if you think like never rush the steps then that makes it that makes a fair amount of sense about you know getting like oh you know if i'm rushing it i'm gonna get all out of whack yeah that that does make more sense as a word for that um for sure um so the other thing he reiterates in the feet part but he also reiterates in a lot of his single sword play um or at least the first play our first rules is you want to keep the sword close to the opponent's um, sword. Um, I didn't say close to the opponent's sword there, but it is always says keep it running along the, the edge of the opponent's sword uh, without touching. It often will parentheses later without touching. You want to run it along the same line as your opponent's sword so that you have control of that line. And if they move, you can make small motions within your foot motions, you can make small sword motions with your wrist um, to control where the line is and to control that blade. So you would run it poop, right along the edge, but not touching and forcing. Um, if, you lose, if you lose the advantage of tempo by proceeding, if you lose your advantages at all, if you become in danger, retreat and regain your advantage. So this is not a just proceed forward willy nilly. You have to have um, an amount of line control in order to proceed in um, to gain that, that blade um, and to gain the advantage of the tempo of moving without creating a tempo first. And I'm gonna see if anyone has any questions or comments before we go on to our first rule. So he has six rules um, and I'm only covering the first rule of six because there's a lot of information and we wanted to touch on swords and touch on swords and daggers. Um, and I feel like the words first rule is a little uh, deceptive because it's kind of like the first set of ideas with multiple rules within them because you think of rule and you're like you know 
you know, the rule of don't touch the blade is a rule, but this has like multiple plays and ideas with different parts. So think of it more as like the first lesson rather than a first rule would probably be a better, um, better way to think about it. And he goes over a lot of um, kind of facts about this first idea, this first um, uh, section, and then he goes through plays that illustrate them. So this will be the the plate will be the words will be a little long, and then we'll get to the plates, which will reiterate these ideas. Um, so the first thing to do is consider um, where your opponent is weak and place the sword on the weakest side or the uncovered side of your opponent. Your arm should be extended and slightly strained, so not, not locked out. We never want to lock out our joints, but uh, extended and uh, slightly straightened. Um, still a soft elbow, not a... Not a um, your point should be your above your opponent's point, and that is very important for this first um, play essentially. Um, you don't make blade contact, just like a lot of his, uh, his mantras throughout. Um, don't make blade contact. And if your opponent is third and fourth, it's easier to keep your blade above. If it's first or second, you might need to find uh, the strong line as opposed to keeping your blade above. So you might, you might wind up having to use your um, your ergonomics of your um, strong of the blade versus weak of the blade and your angles that we talked about way earlier on in that book that he now is like, eh, that's just, you know, everybody knows stuff. Um, when you move, you want to keep your arm still and run along the edge of the blade without ever leaving it. So um, you're going to run along the edge and your, where your point initially starts. So you're starting far enough out of measure that your points are just crossing and you're, you're just slightly above. That gives you enough advantage that as you run along, your point will keep going forward. Your hilt's gonna wind up at that crossing intersection. So if my wrist is the hilt, um, that is where your hilt winds up and then your point winds up in, uh, in the armpit typically. So um, you're just going to run along the edge and you're not going to touch by run along the edge. It's not pushing along the edge. It's, it's running along the line. And so maybe thinking run along the line of their blade um, would be a better way to think about it. So um, the second set of what he talks about is he goes through, he goes through a bunch of do's and, he don't, and don'ts and he like scatters them throughout, but I've kind of um, put them all onto one slide to make it easier. And we're gonna skip down to the next slide. Hey, um, so our do's are can use a continuous forward motion. Um, we talked about not having too strong of a foot um, or too short of a foot. Don't make it choppy. Don't uh, continuous, nice, smooth motions. Make sure your sword is always stronger than, than your, your opponent's. Um, and make sure that point is covering his line. So you should always have your sword in between you and your opponent, and you should use the strengths we talked about way back before um, to make sure your sword is always at an advantage, always stronger than your opponent. And that strong is not brawn. Remember that strong is sword placement. Um, your sword should always be close to the opponent's blade which allows you to make smaller motions and keep control. Um, if you need to perform a cavazione, you should do it before the opponent finds your blade. So you should not be found when you do the cavazione, then your, your tempo is late. If they start, you need to be starting at the same time. If you need to do it, do it before they find your blade at all. So you have to preemptively keep your blade free. Um, and that line, not free, because it's further out, but free from them controlling that line. You have to keep it controlled. And if neither, neither has a control, you got you to gotta perform that cavazione before they find that control. Um, you need to use sword placement, which I uh, mentioned before, over brawn. Um, it's not wrist or arm strength. 
that's creating that line. It is simply placement and uh, the geometry that's there. Uh, you, if you don't want to over grip your sword because that can actually make you less fluid and it can make you um, uh, harder to move. Um, remember that when you move forward, it's faster than moving backwards. So if you're moving forward, your, your opponent cannot move back as fast as you can. Um, hy hypothetically, sometimes people have really long legs, but, and I have really short legs, but supposedly people can't move back as much as they can do forward. And certainly it will disrupt their guard, which is a good thing. Um, you should hold your arm extended forward. Um, the reason this works or helps out is it helps you judge the height of your hand, the height of their sword point versus your sword point, and it lets you do a placement advantage. It also means you are able to gain the sword from a further distance than if you were closer in, which gives you the advantage of the gain sooner um, or gain the line, if you want to think of it, or stringer. Um, but it helps you gain before, um, because your sword is further out, you get that point able to be on top or whatever uh, angle it needs to be to the advantage before you move in. Um, if your opponent gives you a tempo, this you should still take that tempo. That tempo is more important than proceeding forward. You're proceeding forward because you can do that in an advantage as before a tempo. But if they give you a big tempo, you should still take that tempo. You take that, you earn that. They gave it to you, you take it all day long. So we are going to move on to some of the don'ts. You don't wanna withdraw your arm. So if you're already moving forward, you don't want to be like, oh, maybe, maybe I don't want him to have my sword. You have to proceed forward and keep that, um, that attention forward. Uh, keep that confidence forward. If you would withdraw, you're, you're losing your advantage, you're giving them the tempo. And this is all about taking the tempo before uh, they need to give it to you. Don't fling your sword. Uh, so he says this throughout the book. Uh, you don't want to, to over jab. Uh, you should be nice, already extended forward and coming forward. Um, you also don't want to fling your body forward. Uh, we're all about smooth motions, smooth, even motion to make this proceeding with resolution work. Uh, you don't want to grasp your sword firmly, which we talked about before. It's not about the brawn of it. Um, that can change your ergonomics. Uh, and you need to proceed forward without losing your advantage. If you lose your advantage, you need to back up. So those are the don'ts to be careful of. And we are going to talk about the actions that your opponent might take and how you should react to them. Um, so your opponent might break measure. And if your opponent makes breaks measure while you're proceeding forward, it's they're gaining a tempo to act within that break. Um, if they break measure and they force your sword away at the same time, you should use that tempo that they do because as they force your sword away, that force gives you a tempo because it's moving offline, forcing your sword away. You should use that before they have time to touch your blade to cavation and continue proceeding forward. Um, this keeps your sword in line and will allow you to wound them because their sword will be offline as it forces your sword away, cavation away and just keep coming forward. Um, if they are pushing against your foible, uh, even if they're not, if they, bleh. um, if they push against your foible with their fort, if they have the strength of your blade early on when you first cross and they push against your sword, uh, you should also cavation just like the opponent breaking measure because you are at the same long measure distance that you would be if they were to break measure. And that gives you the time to do the cavation and come in and since you're proceeding forward, you would gain the measure in. So if they're if you're pushed being pushed against your foible, or if they're breaking measure out as pushing against your blade, time to cavation. Next slide. Um, if your opponent breaks measure for a second time, so they broke measure, you fought it around, they try to break measure again, because you can move forward faster than they can move back. 
you are now at a measure advantage. Um, so you do not need to cavation a second time. Once you've done that once, you should be able to, so they push, you cavation, they don't like it, they push against your blade again. You should be able to lower, so they break measure, push again. You should be able to lower into a second stance. Oh, hey, is this a video that does? No, maybe. You should be able to lower um, and stab them because you'll be within measure and close enough that their that your attack will land before their push can disrupt your blade. Um, so turn in second, lower your body, wound them if they do it a second time. Um, don't lower your hand to do it. So don't drop like this because that changes the angle and makes it slower. Uh, it's, you know, straight line is going to beat the angled line that they now need to create since they're offline. Um, and you'll be able to continue passing outside without danger because you're so far forward and past their sword because you can move forward faster than they can move back. Um, the same techniques for break, breaking measure a second time works if they push against your sword and you have the advantage of the fort. So if you're deep enough in, it's all a measure game. If you're within this close measure, just kill them. If you're within this far measure and they're messing with your foible or they've broken measure to get out, that's when you need a cavation because you need that extra space to get in measure. Next slide. Did all that make sense? That was a lot of words. Not hearing anybody hollering, so we're going to keep going. Um, if they break measure and change guard at the same time, you have three options. Um, well, kind of two options. Um, you can back out and reset because now he might be doing something strange. And if you're like, eh, I don't know if I have the advantage, you need to back out and keep that advantage because that part's important. So if you don't feel like you've got it, back out. Um, if you can, you can also decide to let your point follow the changing guard. Uh, and you just when I say point, it's the wrist. Remember, it's not pulling back. It's just with the wrist. So your point can follow that changing guard and you can still proceed forward and hopefully wound him um, or her. Uh, if he tries another guard change, you'll now be closer and that's, it'll be that close measure we talked about a minute ago. That means he changes the guard again. He's given you a tempo. He gave you that tempo advantage. You take that tempo and you, you, uh, you kill them at that point. So, um, so those are kind of the base overall rules of what to do. And we're going to go on to plates, which plate 109, they give lots of options. Um, I do want to get a time check. Julian, are we doing okay? I know you've got some videos. Yeah, we're okay. Okay, cool. Um, so plate 109, he stresses that if opponent gives you a tempo, you take it. Um, we're starting out both in third guards. Our fencer is on the left under the plate uh the word plate um his tip is slightly above the third guard of his opponent even though they are in the same stance and almost exactly identical his tip being slightly above means he has an advantage so he has the advantage of being above and he is going to more quickly be able to take the initiative by proceeding forward um so if the if he were to give in a tempo he should take it just like a normal tempo but he's going to take the advantage before being given a tempo. Um, he should, as we talked about, proceed all the way until the hit, hilt hits where his sword is currently crossed. So he's going to cross his hilt at the foible. And at that point, he will also be hitting his opponent with the point. Um, if your opponent is in the third or fourth angle guard, um, you don't want to follow the line of his blade, because a straight line be beats an angled line, you want to go straight through as though it was a straight sword. Does all that, does that make sense? If he had his sword at an angle and mine is straight, I want to continue straight on to, in my screen, I'm, I'm poking Caleb, or I'm poking um, Julian in the face here. So um, if I, if it's straight, poke him in the face there. If it's angled, you still go, you still follow the, the line of the blade that it's trying to cross, but boom, 
you're going to go straight for without falling down. Make sense? Going on to the next section of plate of plate 110, which is where the wounds come in. These take the setups from 109 and turn them into actual wounds and all the things we talked about in the first section. And um, I wanted to start with the first concept of this. Uh, looks like plate 21 of Fabris's normal guard where he talks about um, instead of using a feint with a tempo, he's just proceeding with resolution. So you don't need that tempo, but it's the same actual wound if you took the feint out because you're getting gaining the time with the tempo of proceeding. Um, so these both start with third on the inside from 109. Uh, the opponent was at disadvantage, as we showed before. Uh, because the opponent is too slow to react, he can only pull his body back because we proceeded in. He was waiting for our tempo and he was like, oh God, and he pu pulls himself back to try to guard his body um, because he was expecting a tempo. Uh, we proceed forward, we are fencer, uh, the successful ones, um, before waiting for the tempo, which surprises him. He doesn't like it. We slowly turn in fourth, which is the same as plate 21, to gain that, uh, that mechanical advantage because we're on the inside as we stab him in his armpit. So uh, that is plate 110. The second way this could happen, because Fabris likes giving various detailed versions, um, and is, is uh, yield concepts, which are on plate 25 as well. Similar concept, not the exact play, but a very similar concept. If your opponent pushes or parries while leaning back, um, he is... Uh, it's gonna throw his line off pressure if you yield. So if he presses, if you yield that blade, his blade's gonna go offline. It's gonna allow you to move forward, capture that past you and stab him in the face. So you're giving him the tempo to push his arm offline, bending down to get your body out of the way, bloop, him into the face. Um, so if he pushes against your sword from that side um, while leaning back, uh, you are at advantage because you've come so far forward. Um, this play always scares me because I don't like the sword being between me and my sword, uh, but that is what the play says. Um, it's one I want to practice because it scares me. Um, if you're on the outside, uh, you would still, so you also turned in second for that one. If you're on the outside, um, you're going to still turn in second. You're going to still lower. If he pushes against that sword, you're going to have enough strength coming in to slide past, and it's the same motion. Um, so if he presses against it, you yield, let him have it, and just come forward and lean down. Um, you can still proceed with resolution. Same theories as before work. Um, we're going to move on to the next slide. Um, this is where he was talking about before, if they break measure, you cavacion. Um, if uh, they try to parry while breaking measure, um, you still cavacion. It's also similar to plate 40 in his earlier book as far as the base theory. Um, so if they parry while breaking measure, move your sword around, keep on coming forward, and you're going to gain that measure. That's the outside measure we were talking about, that long measure, that when you have that, you can change your sword position or should change your sword position to regain and, and uh, continue proceeding forward. Uh, if he pushes um, and tries to do it again, so whoo, -hoo, that worked, it made you cavazione, you're now going to be closer to go ahead and stab him. So he breaks measure once, take the cavatione, breaks measure twice, stab him in the face, or in this case, the armpit. Let's go move on to the next one. All right. Um, if your opponent takes a cavatione to attack against your initial step, 
Um, you're gonna keep the straight course in third or fourth. You are in third, so it's easy to turn to fourth. He is giving you the tempo. He's giving you that time that you wanted in the first place that you didn't want to fight over, which is why you're coming forward in the first place. So you just take it and you're like, thank you. And you take that tempo and you turn into fourth and stab him. Uh, again, this is like um, plate 22, the second paragraph on it uh, talks about this. I, I think I left the plate 25 from the previous one. So ignore that. Um, Keep in mind, always use the advantages your opponents are going to give you. So um, if your opponent takes a cavation to break the measure and he's at the further point, remember where you are in this game when you move is important. If he's at your tip, at your deboil, when you um, when he does that counter cavation, that's when you should counter cavation. But if you're close enough, um, you don't you don't need to counter um so the same concept as he did when he breaks measure if he breaks measure counter cavation um as he cavations um it's it's the same base all the way through um very measure dependent on what you do um and um you know all of the things take a time so we're now at lower guards um, so this, the others were based on the first guard. This is based on if your opponent is holding your sword, his sword at a lower guard, you're going to, instead of following it, um, straight forward, you still cross over to gain, you still put your tip above his tip to gain that advantage. And once you gain that advantage, your goal is to still put your hilt at the cross. So you're going to kind of make a uh, um, pendulum or a, um, a fulcrum of that space, even though you're not touching, to put your point into your opponent, but your hilt will still meet at that cross. Um, so I'm going to try to breeze by through these because we are getting a little low on time. Um, if he does try to cavation from that guard, it'll be a big old cavation. So it's a pretty safe guard. If he cavation, stab him in the face because that's going to be more time. And we're going to move on to the next one. Um, this one is basically showing the plays of what I just described. Uh, so this is fully uh, realizing how the wound would work from the above picture. So we're going to breeze by this one, even though there's lots of words, these will, I can send slides if people really want to see them. Um, and this is a, we'll put the uh, slides on the group when we, uh, when I post the uh, video as well. Sounds good. Um, this is third against second. If your opponent's in second, because it's, you can't get your tip above in the same way, you have to do a slightly different, a few slightly different things um you still want to be you want to be slightly over that second guard you still want to run along the edge without touching uh but you want to slightly turn your hand from third to fourth instead of dropping down like you would previously you turn it from third to fourth because that gains that blade line right and uh you're going to slightly lower the point for, so your hilt still wants to wind up where the cross is since they're going to be slightly higher during that crossing, your tip's higher, but your guard is lower. So as you as you attack, if you went straight up, you'd be above his head. So you're just going to do that fulcrum thing again and boop, fulcrum right down that point into his armpit. Um, again, same thing if he withdraws to cavation, counter cavation. If he has it, um, if he stays in measure to cavation, you should just hit him. Um, and don't hesitate because hesitation will create, will let you miss the tempo and will give him an opportunity of your stillness. So hesitation, bad, uh, in all of these plates, um, but particularly this one. And we're going to move on. I think I've got one more. Um, if the, if the, if the opponent tries to cavation over your guard, um, this is when you should do fancy, fun, uh, first guard things. 
Um, if, if it's to the outside, use the tempo of his cavation because he's giving you that tempo, right? So this is similar to an earlier plate. Um, I think it's 35, although I'll have to double check that I did my slides right. It was kind of late. Um, so you're going to use that tempo he gives you to turn in first, which blocks that entire line that he's coming at when he cavations over. You're like, cool, I will use that to turn into first. I will take your tempo. And again, you stab him this time in the gut. Um, sorry, that was... And like counter, uh, like plate 114, uh, if he is too far out, you counter cavatio in that. So depends on your measure. Just same theory as through all of them. And I think this was our last plate. Oh, this one was similar to 35. I was right. I'm going to hand it over to Julian. All right, hey everybody. So I am going to talk about the um, the second part. I should say the second, uh, yeah, the second part of the second book, which is uh, rapier and dagger. So really, the rapier and dagger concepts are very similar to the overall concepts introduced at the beginning. Uh, there, he does add a couple general uh, ideas. One of the things he says is that. Um, you should add a little bit more distance between the swords than in single um, because you're compartmentalizing the choice between your sword and your dagger. And just like you've seen, if you've watched the other videos that we've done so far, um, you'll see that when Fabris introduces the dagger into the equation, he really is trying to create a, uh, a decision for the opponent about uh, which side of the... Uh, about you know kind of which opening they'll choose and then using that dagger either to supplement your defense in that line or to uh, basically kind of have a strategic role in that. So when he says that you're creating more distance between the swords uh, than in single, um, really he's saying that you're uh, that you are um, giving the dagger more opportunity to uh, to play a role in what happens when you get into that distance because just like everything in this uh in the second book if you're moving forward and they're not backpedaling as fast as you're moving forward you're going to intersect at some point in time so uh, anyway um you're not necessarily uniting them as much as you would um in the uh in the second part of the first book uh, also, the, you have a higher chance of success with it. extended weapons. Um, you really want to, you know, just like everything that he's talked about so far, you want that extension. You want that extended uh, um, lean forward uh, stance, at least for, I, for Fabris's ideal play. Um, also, just like we talked about before, you, Fabris really likes the idea that your sword is doing the majority of the work. And then your dagger is there to supplement the line that you that your opponent is going to basically turn into for their second intention. So if I'm if I can cover my opponent's blade into an advantage, what he calls an advantage, uh, that dagger is there to defend in the line that they're most likely to change into. I'm going to talk about his second and fourth rules. And I break this down into kind of a decision tree. So the, what we'll do right here is, so first the uh, rule number two. And rule number two, here, let's, uh, oh, whatever, I'll just use a hockey. All right, cool. So rule number two is where you basically have what Letia affectionately called as crabris uh, or crabris. Uh, so in this case, what I'm doing, and you can take a look at me on the video display, is that I have my sword in second and uh, my dagger then, so I have my feet uh, parallel with each other. So I don't have a foot in front of, in front of the other. They're basically right, right next to each other at a little bit wider than, uh, than shoulder hip shoulder width and I am 
lean forward. I have my dagger um, basically joined around the, toward the end of the forte of my sword. And I have my, my, uh, my sword high in secunda and relatively extended. And the point of this is that he is saying that basically your opponent doesn't have a line to the sides and doesn't have a line above you. They have to choose this area in here to attack you. And just like a lot of the kind of tactical decision-making processes that you described earlier, you're forcing your opponent into a predictable course of action. And there's three courses of action that they can choose that he then makes you react to. So you can see in this, uh, in this display, so the first one is if they do nothing or they just attack under your sword into that, into that kind of lower opening that, uh, that you just created. And in this case, you just do your, like I said, your feet are parallel. So you can make a choice about whether you're advancing with your right foot or with your left foot or your right, or really with your sword foot or with your dagger foot. In this case, what you do is you make a quick choice. You just parry inside to clear their sword with that dagger arm. And then you, because your sword's already in seconda, it's really easy to just move right up into, into prima and do a descending, a descending blow or what they call a, uh, a, so an imbrocata. So a stoccata is a, is a strike that is a thrust that rises and an imbricata is a strike that goes lower. So really in this case, you just go from seconda into prima and do an imbricata if they're inside. And I'll show that real quick. So I'm coming in, do, do, do. I parry low to push their blade and I'm keeping my dagger to the outside of my opponent's blade. And I move my, with my sword foot, turn my blade, turn my, my, um, my sword into an imbricata, strike low, and it's done. The other choice is if they choose to disengage to the outside of this dagger. So if they take their sword, which is, should be in this area right here, and they move to this side of my dagger, all I do is I just basically parry to the outside instead. And instead of moving my right leg, I move my left leg and take my sword right here and just make a nice easy thrust to the face. And I'm still making sure that my sword is on the inside of their blade. So I've kind of got a, a double defense with my dagger and my sword giving a strike up to their neck. I prefer the neck to the face most of the time, but that's just me. Um, part of that's kind of an SCA thing where you're more likely to bounce off a mask than a bib. With a bib, if you're, you're pointing there, it's going to stick and it's probably going to stay. Um, the other choice is if they parry high with the dagger in reaction to that kind of descending shot that you're going to do. In that case, all you got to do is, and you got to make this quickly, you got to make this decision quickly. If you really start to see their blade start to move up, and as soon as they start to make that decision, then you turn your blade into seconda instead. You keep that blade in seconda, and you do more of a lower line shot into their uh, into like their armpit, as depicted in the plate, or into kind of their belly or solar plexus area. And I'm going to show a video real quick of uh, a bit of me and my student last night uh, executing some of these. So let's pull this over. All right, so. Letia, can you let me know if this is, turns out really choppy? It's a little choppy. Okay. Um, so here, you can see me taking that that stance at the at, out of measure. I come in, and he's not going to do anything. And that's that simple uh, execution right there. So I'll do kind of frame by frame here. I come in and as soon as my my dagger crosses his double A, that's when I start the movement. Z, moving above, imbricata. And there we go.
That's basically if they do nothing. So the next couple are me fucking up. So I'm going to skip ahead. Uh, let's see. So this should be where he actually does execute the disengage to my outside. So, all right, so I'm coming in. Is this better, Letia? Yeah. Okay, so he executes that disengage to my outside. I then catch it with my dagger to my outside. And there we go. We're moving through. So that's that second option. And these next couple also don't work out. So one thing, that last play where they parry high, it's, it's really hard to react to that. You really want to catch that tempo early. Uh, let's see. So I think this last one works out for me. So let's go. All right, so I'm moving in. No. Okay, here. All right, here we go. I think this, this is it. All right, yeah, so he, he starts to parry high. You can see he's just beginning to move his dagger as I'm doing this. So the moment he starts to move that dagger high, there, you can see, and then I move low. In this case, I miss, but I turn into a draw cut, which is legal in the SCA. I think the next one is uh, uh, works out just fine. All right. Yeah, there we go. All right. So you can see those are kind of that's kind of a three part decision decision make matrix of that uh, of rule two. So we'll go to rule four. We're probably going to go a little long, so I apologize for anybody who. You're okay to go out to leave if you need to leave. Um, but we're going to walk through rule four because rule four is pretty complex, but it's also pretty cool. Um, rule four is focused on the idea that your opponent is moving their blades constantly. So either they're kind of pumping with their pumping with their blades, you know, kind of uh, moving up and down or circling or that sort of stuff. Um, it's really based on that kind of opponent. And if you have any experience in the SCA, or um, if you you know have a lot of experience with HEMA tournaments, you probably, in fact, you probably see it more in HEMA tournaments. To be completely honest, an opponent who really is amped up, they've got their, they've got their, uh, you know, their kind of adrenaline going. They're kind of moving their swords like all over the place. This is, or their blades all over the place. This is kind of what that is for. So rule four has uh, has a couple different parts. And so you can see the first part. In this part, the, your opponent is moving up and down with the dagger. And the basic guard for this, by the way, is where you're in quarto. So you've got that kind of basic Fabris guard. You're leaning forward and you've got your uh, sword leg forward and you've got your, 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 uh, your blade, your main rapier blade in quarta, and you've got your dagger extended. So I'm basically right here as I'm coming in. And in this case, your opponent is moving up and down with their dagger and maybe moving a little bit with their blade, with their sword as well. In this case, all you got to do is you're advancing in there judiciously. You can you saw on those video plays that I wasn't like really going in there fast. I was going in there kind of with an imminence of danger to my opponent, but not so fast that I wasn't able to execute my decisions um, in time. So anyway, uh, basically the idea is at the moment, your opponent's moving their dagger kind of up and down or in and out. So you can see kind of with me, you know, like this kind of, this kind of movement, this kind of movement. And the idea is that you are keeping your sword just in front of their dagger. As you're advancing and you're keeping your sword just ahead of where their dagger is. So that as soon as they basically bring their dagger up or bring or and are about to bring their dagger down or have brought their dagger forward and are about to bring their dagger back, as soon as that dagger like is about to move out of presence, you then take that high line and go above it. And you can see that in the bottom part of that play. Now with the dagger, one thing that he really emphasizes is that you do not 
bring your dagger so far forward that your dagger is carrying your opponent's blade in their forte because then you lose the advantage. Instead, he emphasizes that you basically move your dagger back as you go inside, that you keep your, your dagger's blade with their debole, with the end of their blade. So you still have that advantage. So you can see in the bottom plate there that he has retreated his dagger blade to stay intersected with the debole of his opponent's sword. And then once he's close enough, you're, as soon as their opponent brings their dagger into a into a disadvantageous line because they're moving it constantly, then you just take that you take that line with the point of the rapier and strike them. Now, the second part of rule four is based on the idea that their opponent is circling with the point of their rapier. So sometimes maybe you've seen someone who's kind of all the time moving the point of their rapier blade, you know, all over the place, like da, da, da. And in this case, this is based on the idea of what do I do with that kind of opponent? So you've got the, as I described earlier, the agent is the good guy, the patient's the bad guy, agent's the person that wins. So you can see at the top of that, the patient is making circles with the tip of their sword. So you've got three decisions to make in this process. So the first decision is if they do nothing. And, and this is also if they try to basically move slow, slowly with their dagger to the inside. Um, the basic guard for this is that you, once again, you've got your sword and quarta, you, you're advanced, and you're focusing the point of your sword into kind of the mezzo or the middle of the of the opponent's sword as they're kind of circling it around. I'm not necessarily explicitly trying to get the advantage or to gain their blade. I'm really just kind of keeping it there. So as I advance, I have that, I have like that being right at kind of the apex of that circle as they're as they're moving it around. So if they do nothing, all I have to do is I take my my sword, and especially if they're moving their dagger inside, I'm keeping that lower. And then as a as I get into the into the right me, into the right measure, all I do is I just pick that pick that point up and go into their into their higher extremity, probably their upper chest or their neck area. And if they bring that dagger in there, they're gonna miss you in time because you've gotten so close to them that you're inside basically their, their reaction time. So I'm gonna do the right one first because the bottom part is the more complex one. So if they parry early with their dagger, so let's say they see this coming and they're in kind of more of a conventional stance where like they're, they're doing kind of the Capoferro or the, or the Gigante thing. And they're like, ha, I'm, I'm in there right away. Then you just do a really typical cavazione where you just, I'm in here and I cavazione into seconda around their dagger and then catch them into their, uh, into their dagger line uh, above their, um, into their probably uh, high left, high dagger side uh, chest or once again into the neck area. So pretty simple. And then the last one is if uh, basically you're doing the same thing as the first one where, uh, where they are relatively slow with their dagger or they don't react at all. Uh, or, or in this case, sorry, they, they counterattack the quarter. So let's say they don't, they don't defend with their dagger at all. Instead, they choose to use their sword. So once again, I'm in quarta, I'm going low and I'm trying to basically kind of move in on their sword and they, you know, they're probably a more educated opponent and they decide I'm just going to take their sword with my sword and turn it into quarta. In this case, uh, all I do is I turn, so I'm, I'm low in this line. What I do is I turn that into a dagger parry. I don't even attempt to use my sword to meet that, to meet their blade. I turn that into a dagger parry and then pass and move into their high line. I'm not trying to move to the other side of their dagger because I'm too close for them. At this point, um, if I try to execute that cavazione around their dagger, 
in response to their action. I'm probably too far into the res into the um, response that that's going to be successful. At best, in the SCA, that's going to turn into a draw cut. And then if they Pobrisis decides to throw this in there because it, it looks cool. Uh, I'm sure he has a better reason for that, but um, you can see if they then, you know, they see that coming as like the hits about to happen and they like lean back, you can then use your dagger to, uh, to um, basically kind of push on inward and skewer them with both of your blades. So it looks cool. Um, generally Fabris doesn't like the idea of using your dagger offensively, but he says, Hey, if they lean back and, uh, or they backpedal and you're already coming in there, then get them with both blades uh, because you're not really going to be going anywhere else anyway. So yeah, that's the, that's rule four. Um, and I'm going to show a quick video of me trying to execute it. And I'm not always successful. I'm not going to do this unedited so you can see how um, it doesn't always work right. So... This is a minute and 40 seconds. All right. So you can see my cadet. He's kind of, he's going to be kind of moving his, all of his, his blades all over the place. So I'm trying to keep my point in front of his dagger until the decision that I need to make. So that one actually worked out pretty well. I'll, uh, here, let's um you might want to mute the video if you can yeah no point to that all right actually i'm going to use my other video player for this because it's better all right here we go All right, here we go. So I'm coming in there. You can see that I'm keeping my point in front of my opponent's dagger blade instead of letting letting it go past them. He starts to move. He moves it out of line. I'm keeping my I'm keeping my dagger instead of moving all the way forward to his forte. I'm keeping that back here. And basically, as soon as I'm close in enough, I move my point from in front of his dagger to his target area, and then pass on through. OK, a little bit of a similar concept there. Okay, so in this case, I move to my dagger side. So you can see, staying in front, he moves. he's moving his blade along, so he's moving his uh, rapier blade uh, as I'm continuing on, and, but because I'm keeping my dagger back here, I'm able to kind of um, stay at that apex uh, at the end of his blade where I can um, maintain control of it. In this case, I scoop my arm low, and I'm still able to keep control of it. And the rest of the video is just me doing riffs on the same concept, so I'm not going to beleaguer that. So anyway, uh, those are those are kind of the two of the uh, the plays for uh, Rule Four. Uh, Letia and I have covered uh, the here. We'll stop sharing this. Okay, so Letia and I have covered. Um, the rule one of book two, part one, and rules two and four of book two, part two. There's a lot more of these. And I would argue that if you want to make these successful, if you want to make that, you know, kind of continually moving in work, you need to practice these. This isn't something that you're going to be able to do like right off the bat. Uh, because it's probably going to end up really messy. And even for experienced rapier, uh, experienced Fabris fencers trying to do book two techniques, a lot of times it ends up messy anyway. So if, if, there's a, if there's anything I can say about making book two work, it's practice, practice, practice. 
uh, that the you really need to be able to, to move in and get a second sense for when that critical decision needs to happen and then execute it instinctively at that moment and then continue on through. But it's really effective if you can make it work. And then another thing, last thing I'm gonna say is that because there's what, there's four rules in the first part and, uh, sorry, six rules in the first part and four rules in the second part. If you can um, recognize these as they happen, it's actually really useful. So you can see like experienced fiber fencers and you can say, oh, you know, I kind of know, I know what play you're trying to do here. And I know what decision you're trying to make. And uh, so make can be for, make. yeah, exactly. So it can be kind of worthwhile to spend like two or three of your practices just working through these. So you can kind of know you can, if anything, you can recognize them as people are trying to play them against you. So that's all I got. Uh, Alexia, I will give you the last word. Um, I would I would go back to the beginning of what you were saying with the last bit there is understanding the concepts in book one um, about how blade mechanics work also are really fundamental to understanding a lot of what goes on in part two, even though he's like, and we'll just ignore this little part a lot of them really mesh together. So um, make sure you got your fundamentals down as well um, so that if they give you a tempo, you can take advantage of that and you see that and you see all the parts um, before charging in there. And don't charge because he says not to charge. So don't, don't use that word. Don't use that no, word. No, you, you saw in my, you saw in the videos that I was moving in, I was basically moving in as fast as I'm comfortable moving and it was still pretty slow. But the point of the matter is that, like he talks about at the very beginning of it all, I'm still not giving my opponent the opportunity to read me. If anything, that's, that's probably one of the biggest virtues of all of this is that I'm, I'm, I'm creating this basically wall that's closing on my opponent. And they, it ends up creating kind of a pucker factor for them where they're like, oh shit, you know, what am I going to do? And maybe they're not going to make as intelligent of a decision as they would if you were just standing at measure with them and waiting for something to happen. Mm -hmm. So uh, does anyone have any questions? All right. So this will be recorded. I'm going to post it up on YouTube and uh, I'll also post our, um, the uh, slideshow that we have. So thank you everyone for coming. We've got uh, uh, two more of these. The next one is um, Tabo's uh, Bose plays against Faber Spencers and maybe what you can do as a Faber Spencer against them. And then the last one is uh, kind of doing a talk about the continuing Faber's, the continuing Faber's lineage manuals on throughout the 1600s. So thank you so much. And uh, we really appreciate it. So, toodles.